I know by now that you're praising God. For his work he's doing in us. We're chasing after what God is doing in us. And, and uh, it's become evident as each brother gets up and speaks, as the comments are being made and these things. Now, in the work that God is doing among men, and just the execution of his salvation, which is what we're pertaining to, the transforming of the saints of God, and bringing, and generally bringing all the saints to glory, we have God the Father, and when Jesus Christ the Son, and we have the blessed Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit working in this endeavor. You know, what we have in salvation, now this could not come to pass, except that we had all three of them working together, and they, they, they set the precedence for us in unity as they work to bring salvation to men. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, as we look at, at salvation, we're going to look at the work of the Spirit of God. It is near the close of his earthly ministry in John 16, 16, where Jesus tells his disciples who are gathered there with him, a little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall, you shall see me, I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, what is this that he saith unto us, a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. So Jesus, he tells them very plainly in verse 28, I came forth from the Father, and I am coming to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Then they understood what he was saying. However, these words, though, these words of Jesus, of their Lord's soon departure, fill their hearts with sorrow. We're sad to hear this. Jesus continues, but Jesus he tells him about the comforter that he would send, a holy comfort that would come and dwell with them and in them. And he's, gonna, he's going to comfort them in this world. The spirit of truth, Jesus calls him. He would come to them during his absence, and he would continue to guide the brethren of Christ into all truth and comfort them. I have, many, uh, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he... When the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Amen. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you the things to come. He shall glorify me, for he, he shall receive of mine, and he shall show unto thee. That Holy Spirit would come, and he would comfort the people of God. He would be as a consolation to us, to the saints, and he would be for the saints forever. Jesus said. Now in Acts, the first chapter, Jesus again with his apostles, but this is, this is for the very last time he is with them. And they are full of questions concerning the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which ye have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he that, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was received out of their sight. Now, it's the spirit that dwelleth in you, brethren, that we're talking about this morning. Now, we have two texts. We have Romans 8 and we have 1 Corinthians 3.16. Both of them deal with with this aspect of the indwelling of the Spirit of God. This, this is what Jesus was talking about. This Spirit would come to them and would abide in them and be with them. So this is what we're kind of, we're, the, the Spirit of God is a big subject, of course. But we're going we're gonna to limit our, our discussion this morning to what, Je, the, what these two texts are dealing with. That aspect of the Spirit that it binds in the people of God. Now, He's a spirit that dwelleth in us, Paul says in Romans 8 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, Paul begins that passage with a but. There's a but there 
because in the previous verse, Paul makes this statement, that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So Paul, he says, but ye are not in the flesh, but ye have, you, in other words, you can please, you're not in the dominion of the flesh no longer. Paul reasons that the, uh, the Spirit of Christ dwells in the people of God, so then we can please God. We can continue to reason with this, that uh, unless, unless the Spirit of Christ resides in a man and abides in a man, then uh, he cannot be pleasing to God. Now, this is the Spirit that our brethren first received in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit. This is the same Spirit that our brethren received uh, from the promise that, uh, that Jesus gave to them. We read about it, and on the day of Pentecost, and this took place 10 days after Jesus ascended, when the Spirit of God entered the temple area where the saints were gathered. And you remember the account, there suddenly came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now when this was noise abroad, and the multitude came together, they were confounded. Because er, heard every man speaking in his own language. Peter says to this puzzled multitude who were confounded that this, that this is that spirit that was spoken of by the prophet Joel, which when he said, And it shall come to pass in these last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is that day, Peter pronounced. And this is the fulfilling of that promise that Joel made and that promise of salvation and of the indwelling spirit is unto you and unto your children and to all them that are far off, as many as our Lord Jesus shall call. And he gives that, he gives that command, you remember? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about that spirit that dwelleth in the saints. Now, you can see by this account, I went through this because I wanted to establish that there was a time when the Holy Spirit of God was sent. He just didn't like what's there. He was sent. There's a big thing made of this. Jesus went about it. He, went, he made, wanted to make it clear. He promised to us the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit was sent. When the work of Christ was completed, when he accomplished what God gave him to do, then the Holy Spirit was sent. Amen. Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit just as he said. And he is the Spirit of Christ to all those that belong to him. The indwelling Spirit is to seal on all those who are begotten of God. Amen. The Spirit of God is the surest mark that distinguishes the people of God from those who belong to this world or those who don't belong to him. Amen. Everything that accounts for, for our peculiarity and our strangeness as we live in this present situation can be credited to the indwelling spirit. Peter says, the world thinks it's strange that you no longer run with them to the same excesses of righteous living because we, because we abstain from the excesses that the world offers. This is a strange thing to those who are governed by them, to those who run after this. It's a strange thing that we do not. Now, the reason all this is because we, know, we no longer belong to this world. Amen. The people of God are not trying to be strangers. We're not trying to be strange. And we're, we're not trying to be pilgrims. We're not trying to be that, brethren. We are. Amen. We are in reality. We are, real, we are strangers and pilgrims of this world. We have, our, we have distanced ourselves because the world is not like God. And our detachment should be evident. Do you remember he is called the Holy Spirit? He is the one who, who sanctifies us and makes us holy so, so, so we have no uh, belonging to the things that are not holy. We have been made this way by the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have been called out you see, and we've been separated, and we've been marked by the Spirit of God. All those who belong to Jesus Christ have the spirit of adoption, a spirit which itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And we walk not after the spirit 
of this world, but we walk after the spirit of the kingdom of God. That was in Acts 2 that I just went through. We see how, how it is that men come into the kingdom. We, we, we learn the means by which we are translated out of this world into the kingdom of God. There is a, there's an actual procedure, if you want to use that word. We're actually translated. Uh, you can mark the time, brethren, when this is actually done. It shouldn't be clear. I mean, it shouldn't be unclear and cloudy. And, you know, it, it should be something you can put your finger on. We are taken out of this physical realm, okay, and we're put in a spiritual one. And this is being done. This is being done while we keep these physical bodies and while we stay in this, in this world. This is done. We're taken out of the, this physical realm and put in a spiritual one. Remember, we were dead to God. This particular work, this glorious thing that God is doing, well, it's being done by the Spirit of God. Now, I want to look at John 3, 6. We touched on this several times. I want to use it. I want to tie it to our, one of our sign texts where we are born in the kingdom through the Spirit and we stay in the kingdom walking in the Spirit. And we never leave this place. John 3, Nicodemus, you know the story better than I do. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He didn't ask Jesus about the kingdom of God. But it was the kingdom of God that Nicodemus needed. Jesus begins to teach Nicodemus the nature of God's kingdom right off the bat. It's a stunning thing to Nicodemus when he hears that a grown man must be born again. For this is... An, but, but uh, Jesus points out to Nicodemus how stunning it is that a teacher of Israel don't know these things. It was stunning to him. So because this is not a new thing, Nicodemus, you know. God promised he was going to do this a long time ago. It was not a new word, in other words, is what I'm saying. This is not the first word about this. Over and over, God had spoken concerning a new thing I do. I will raise them up. A prophet like unto thee. I will raise me up, a faithful high priest. I will raise up a righteous branch of David. In scriptures, can a man be so busy with a system of religion that he missed the truth concerning a new birth, you reckon? Yes, yes. This new covenant is a spiritual one. And to be a part of it, we gotta get a, we got to get into that domain of the spirit. For God is a spirit. And if you're going to worship God, Brethren, you got it. You must do so in the spirit and in the truth. Religion is not about what's going on down here. Okay, really, it's not. It's not about earthly things. Really, it's what about it's what it's what's going on up there, in the spiritual realm, and what's going on in heaven dictates. Really, it dictates what goes on down here. Amen. And only the spirit knows what's going on up there. Only the Spirit knows what's going on in the mind of God. We need the Spirit. Now, here are the facts that Jesus teaches. No one can afford to miss this. I'm sure Nicodemus was paying attention. The kingdom of God is a spiritual one, Nicodemus. And to come into it, you've got to be born again. Jesus says exactly, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. Jesus is talking about the necessity of the new birth here. You can be baptized 50 times in water, but if you're not born again, that is, if you're not born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus links the two together, doesn't he? He links, let's see, water and Spirit. Now, people want to argue about this. They want to ask questions like, uh, uh, what do you mean by water? What is, what is meant by water here? We just tell them it means water. The, kind, the same kind of water that they baptized the 3,000 in in Acts 2. It's the same water that the Ethiopian eunuch recognized when he was there and uh, speaking about the things of God. The whole point of bringing men into the kingdom of God, brothers, so that God can then do something with our sorry condition. God has to determine, he is determined to associate everything that happens at that time at that time when we're born again, this is a spiritual work. He's, he's determined to associate all this with water. When we are baptized, we got to be delivered out of this world. We really do. we got to be cleaned up. And all our transgressions and our sins, they've got to be removed before God can do anything. The Apostle John says he washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
and such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. Be ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Amen. We know all men have to be brought into the kingdom of God, for all men are exiles and aliens of God. It's not anything we can do on our own, you see. It's something that's got to be done to us. It's got to be, be something done for us. Now, whether men like it or not, this is a spiritual work, okay? Cleansing and washing away of our sins. Now, this is done when we're baptized in water. Huh? Yeah. The question comes up, <laughs> do, do we have to be baptized to be saved? I want to give you a better question. Do you have to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? And then you can reason a little further. Can anyone expect to be saved without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Amen. We tell people, don't be like Naaman the leper and stumble at this. Just go and do what the prophet said to do. Amen. You know? Now, a very important thing to know about baptism that it clearly marks. This is a really good thing for us, brother. It clearly marks the time when we receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. You can, like I said earlier, you can put your finger on it. It is the means, and it's a manner that the Spirit comes to abide with us. We need this. Men can't, come, men can't call down the Spirit of God. Huh? We can't conjure up with the Spirit of God with any kind of chants, songs, and tambourines. <laughs> you can't do that. Paul said, if you have come to God through Jesus Christ, you have the indwelling Spirit of God. What has happened to us in Christ Jesus has come about by the power of the Spirit. Paul told the Jews, now don't be boasting in your Jewish heritage. Who is a Jew anyhow, he said. But he is a Jew which, one, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the Spirit. And not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now he's talking, talking about internal, internal change as opposed to an external effort, internal, inside of us. That's a work that is entirely of God. Amen. Moses said, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Remember what Stephen said just before they took him out and stoned him? I don't know if they took him out. I think he was, he was already a ye uh, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always do resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. This circumcision, now we're talking about, of course, we, you understand, it's made without, without hands. It's the operation of God. It's something that God is doing. The cutting away of the body of sin and the knowledge of sin, all this is done by the Spirit of God. And being raised to new life, but now we are delivered from the law. We're delivered from our own efforts. Paul said, that being dead went in within ye were held. But we worship God, but that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Amen. Now, he's a, he is establishing a connection between new life in Christ and the spirit. The kingdom of God is a spiritual one. But we worship God truly in the spirit of life, new life, and that with a new heart that is fully in sync with him. Now, we talk about the power of God and the power of the Spirit. Jesus said, you, sh you shall come with, with power in the Holy Spirit. He promised that because Jesus knew it was going to take power, you know, to, to do these things. He said, you shall receive power that the Holy Spirit has come. Now, we can say the same thing about the Holy Spirit as that scripture says about Christ, that they are the same yesterday and today. The Holy Ghost comes to us today with the same power, brethren, that filled the hearts of the believers from their very outset. You know where it says they went about and they turned the world upside down for Christ and this kind of enthusiasm and power of the Spirit. If the Spirit still comes with this power, he never changes. It's the same effectual power that makes our ministry effectual. Back in Acts 1.8, the disciples asked Jesus, Will thou at this time 
restore again the kingdom to Israel, Jesus replies, it's not for you to know what's, in, what's only in the power of God to do, but you shall, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, every one of us who is out in the battlefield, we all have learned, we've all learned from living in this world that the things of God are not all about a bunch of talk. It's, it's not really. I mean, we need to talk, but it's more than that. We need real power. We need an enabling power to overcome and press on, don't we? Amen. We have learned the kingdom of God is, 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 is not in word, but in power. When it comes to the things of God and the kind of work that's taking place in the kingdom of God, more is needed than what just a mere man can do. And, and more is needed than what a, a, a mere man can say. Paul said, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. I came in the power of God and the Holy Spirit. And even today, more is needed than just a, a good knowledge of the word. Paul said, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, but by a demonstration of the spirit and of power. In the accounts given in the scripture from the, uh, from the very beginning, when the Holy Spirit was given, our early accounts always associates the power of God with the spirit of God. All the outworking of God was associated with the Spirit moving in His people. Uh, today, it's no different today, isn't it? Today we look. We look for the same thing. We're looking for the outworking of God through His Spirit. We're looking for demonstrations of, of things that only the power of God can do. That's what we're looking for. If it doesn't require the Spirit of God, well, we're not much interested in it, really. And you know why I say this? You know why I say it? It's because of this church world. Things have been going on for longer than I can remember. Going on in the name of the Lord. Things that doesn't require the power of God to do. Paul asked this question today. Did you, re did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? In other words, did you re receive the Spirit by your own efforts? Or by the hearing of faith? It is by faith we stand in the power of God, and by the Spirit we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You read where Paul exhorts the brethren, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Now, how are we able to do that? When we, when we, we'll come at the end of the day when we accomplish that, how are we able to do that? Was it just a good day for us? Well, yes, it was. When we're confirmed to the end, brethren, when, when God said he, when God does what he said he's going to do, he'll confirm us until the end. Well, how was it? It was by the power of God's might, by the Spirit, indwelling Spirit. In us. This, this power is only realized in new life, vibrant life. We need a power to live unto God, for God is able to make him stand, he said. Now, we're interested in this new life that the Scriptures talk about. The power that comes by this, the, the power of new life that comes by way of the Spirit. Now I heard God was doing a new thing. Did you hear about that? I, that's what I want you to tell me about. You know? Talk to me about what God is doing. That new thing. That's what the saints of God wants to hear about. What God is doing in this new thing. We got people out there walking the streets, brethren, looking for someone or something to change their lives. Okay. Thousands of them everywhere, old and young alike, they're looking for a miracle in their lives. Yeah. They're not looking for some kind of temporary, really they're not. They're not looking for some kind of temporary recovery from the situation. Really, they're looking, they're looking for a complete change. Deep down inside, they know it's going to take a miracle. They know deep down inside, my situation is going to take something with, with power and some kind, something with real substance. Everybody wants a new life. They do. Everybody wants a new life whether they realize it now or not. And, you know, God's got, give, got one to give. God's got a new life to give men. He's willing to give. He's willing to give me new direction and new purpose, better, satisfying, completely fulfilling life. God has appointed, he, God has even extended himself, and he's appointed a man to do this very thing, to give newness of life. Now, the point is, 
knowing that God has in fact, that he has made provisions for the needs of men in this regard. It, it's it's, a, it's a, a, a downright shame, isn't it? When you, when you hear about people who make this kind of cloudy, when they make what God has provided, when they make this hard to find, I mean, uh, when, when, when it's, uh, it make it almost downright impossible for people to find newness of life in Christ Jesus. Well, God is not going to let this continue. He'll, he'll solve that problem. Now, in the chapter that our text is uh, in, it's an exhortation for the saints to pursue this newness of life we're talking about. It, it, it's an exhortation to, to go after and, and, and go after the spirit of God that gives us new life. And this is the work of the indwelling spirit to, to, to enable us to pursue after this. Now, in the, in the chapter that was previous to this one, if, uh, Paul had set the stage for himself to expound the nature of newness of life, to expound life in the spirit. Because, you know, this is where chapter 7 is where Paul, he talks about the conflict of the flesh and the spirit that all those who are born again, they enter into. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the fallen nature of Adam, which inhabits this body. Paul speaks of the same thing throughout the scriptures. Galatians 5, where he says the spirit, the spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things you would. That is, walking in the spirit and following after spiritual things, pursuing the spiritual things, they're not easy to do. There are people who God has so graciously, I kindly call. They wander in every direction. They do. Not allowing themselves to be guided by the Spirit. They're stressed and harassed by life. And they're stunted in growth. But Paul declares in our text that God has made every provision for the saints not to live in this manner. He said, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit of life because of righteousness. Amen. Those who have been made alive in Christ Jesus not live as though they were dead. Where sin brought death, you see, the Spirit brings life, newness life. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. It is the Spirit that gives life. We just got to get outside the domain of the flesh, you see. Amen. Actually, uh, if we're really going to get to the business of living for God, we got to get out of that domain, don't we? And you know, the best way to do that is to walk in the Spirit of God. Amen. Now, everything that God is doing in salvation, it relates to men, and it all relates to men. He's doing so through Christ Jesus. It is Jesus who made the salvation of God possible. His sinless life he lived. And his substitutionary death for us. And he brought salvation within our reach. Paul said he brought life and immortality immortality to those who were perishing. Amen. Now he which established us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who hath also sealed us and given us the earnestness of the Spirit in our hearts. The things that Christ has accomplished they are being applied and they're actually operating in the saints. What Jesus Christ came to accomplish, see the Holy Spirit has taken them and he's made them operational in us. The spiritual things of God are now being given to the saints. This is the day of salvation, and we can become acquainted with the things of heaven. We can get to know the God of heaven. We can draw near. The Spirit of God has brought us near to God. For there's a work that needs to be done. It needs to be done to us and in us. And that's why we've been placed under the jurisdiction and the protection and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, all this work is being done between two days. It's being done in the day that we were sealed. And it's being done into that day of our full redemption. The work that's being done. We often uh, depict this in the analogy of the building of the temple in Solomon's day. The building project, we call it, where they removed large quality stones out of the quarry and hauled them to, to the city there. Actually, they were already in the city, but they hauled them on site. They were called Solomon's quarries. They're still there. Someone said there was as many as 80,000 stone cutters. 
just to cut the stone. 70,000 men to carry them. It was a national project. Everybody was called into it. They had 3,300 supervisors, men who managed these workers. It was a massive task building this temple in Jerusalem. Now, the reason I brought this up, if you can, if you can see how massive this temple project is, it was a great, what about the temple of God that's being built on the foundation of Jesus Christ? I mean, in the new Jerusalem, you see, this, this is a massive. We are his workmanship with spiritual stones cut out of the quarry of this world. We were once dead, but we were made alive. We're now living stones cut and prepared in this world and we're carried to be used on site in the world to come. Now all this preparation, all this getting ready, us ready, it's the work of God through his spirit. The scriptures say that, we, that all will be taught of God. The scriptures, uh, we, they will all be taught of God. Jesus quoted Isaiah when he said, it is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. They shall all be taught. Now who you think is doing all going to do all this teaching? Teaching of God. This job belongs to the Spirit of God. You're right. And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Paul said, but it is written, I hath not seen, talking about the Spirit heading over this, this project. Paul, Paul said, as it is written, I hath not seen, ear heard, Neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love them. But God hath revealed them unto us, to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. First thing we've got to figure out about things, particularly people when we meet them, do they have the Spirit of God abiding in them? I say this because the Spirit of God is working and the brethren. We've got to forget what they claim or what they profess, but we've got to be looking for, for indications that they know God, right? They said they'll be all taught of God. Yeah. To some degree, this has got to be taking place because that's the Holy Spirit's work, teaching the saints about God. He said, all those taught of God will come to me. Now, I just quoted two verses out of 1 Corinthians 2. Really, that's, that's a wonderful chapter telling about the work of the Spirit of God as, as he's building, uh, working on God's project. Need to read the whole chapter but, or the rest of it. But, I, but Paul makes the point that all things belong to the Spirit. And no man can know the spiritual things of God except the Spirit of God. He, is the, he was the eyewitness of God. He has access to all the plans and all the purposes of God. They're all known to him. And he is the appointed by me, a means by which men come to know these things. The, when the, the Father is heard, when Christ is heard, you see, that's how it works. And the Father is seen when Christ is seen. And he told us this. Amen. Now, if we want to speak in terms of a mission, that the Holy Spirit had a mission, this is what the Spirit is doing. Now, he, he's letting us in on these things. He's taking what Christ has seen and what Christ has said and, he, and he's given them to us. Seeing Christ is absolutely imperative, very to our salvation. I don't know the, how the saints are going to be able to make it to glory if the captain of our salvation is not kept in plain sight. You know, how will the saints know what direction they're going if the Lord is not held up in plain view? Jesus said, "And I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me." I mean, don't. We've got to do this all the time. I understand that, that what he was talking about initially. You'll raise me up. But then we've got to keep him raised up. Yeah. The indwelling is drawing from the works of God in Christ Jesus. He's drawing from that work, that accomplishment, and he's teaching the people of God. Increase in knowledge and understanding of God in Christ Jesus. So that when we get the glory, you see, we will be ready to enter into that work. In that particular spot, that particular place that was within God's purpose from the very beginning. You know, he appointed all things from then. The purpose of God, it'll continue. It's an eternal one. The scriptures say we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Holy Spirit is getting us ready for that time. 
Now, do you remember what, it, what Jesus said to his uh, to the disciples that the Spirit would do when he came? He said he would take of mine and show it to you. Three times, actually 13, 14, 15, three times, uh, one in each verse, he says this in a different way. That the Spirit of God will not be distracted from this. That's what he's going to do. He's going to take from what Christ accomplished and he'll give it to the saints. He's going to open it up. You have heard the statement made over and over, over and over, and it's true. It's true. It's not God who has changed, but it, it's, it's us. Actually, God has changed us. In fact, the scriptures say we are being changed into his image as we behold the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, I, I went to read this, even as by the Spirit. The Spirit knows the mind of God, and He knows us. He knows what's in my, my mind, he, and He knows each one of us. He can, he can bring about this in us. I, I'm talking about this change. He can, he can bring about this change in us. The expectation that God has for each one of us, now He can make that a possibility. See, he's working to make that actually. God has an expectation for me. But in the Spirit of God, he can, he can accomplish that in me. He intercedes for us, brethren. He's interceding in behalf of that purpose of God and that accomplishment that he, God wants. And he helps me in my weakness. I, ha I have infirmities. In the Spirit of God, he helps me. See how, how, in, how uh, uh, important he is. Amen. Indispensable was the word I found. See how indispensable he was. Uh, my, ex my final, well, my final exhortation. I'm right on schedule. Let's not grieve this one yeah, who's working in us. Make his job hard. We don't want to do that. I don't want to frustrate. I do, but I don't want to. Make it difficult for him. Make it easy on yourself, brethren. Walk in the Spirit. 